Thank you so much, uh, Oscar. Looking forward to that. Well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, it's the, a lot of tough facts to follow here, but <laughs> nonetheless, I'll make an effort. Uh, well, I'm Oscar Eriksson. It's nice to meet you all. Um, museum, should I just get started, right? If you just share the screen to make sure it's running smoothly. Yeah. So here we are. Um, let me just minimize that. Uh, so I work at Data Robot. We invented uh, what is known as automated machine learning back in 2012. Took our first product to market at 2015. And uh, yeah, we are more than 1,000 people employed. And uh, while we may have started with automated machine learning, we have branched out in every direction now so that uh, we uh, have also uh, included critical parts of the data science workflow, such as deployment of models and data preparation, for example, uh, into our platform. So uh, uh, let's admit this person here. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's more than just model building nowadays, for those of you who, who do. There may have been a bit of a sort of misunderstanding with, with the agenda. Sorry about that. Uh, so you may expect me to talk to you about uh, how to multiply data science in an enterprise. That's a topic I would love to discuss with you at some other point. Uh, you'll get my contacts in the end, and then we can talk about that. Uh, there are many ideas on how to work collaboratively and uh, efficiently across different roles and, and different perspectives in the enterprise. We have a lot of thoughts and opinions about that, and it would be nice to discuss that with you guys. But what I'd like to talk to you about today is uh, really green machine learning, uh, lean green machines. I'd like to introduce the concepts of red AI and green AI, and um, try to explain the problem, what we see, and also a couple of approaches that are also platform agnostic in terms of how to solve them. Uh, we have put quite a lot of effort into that from Late Robot, actually, uh, coming from uh, a couple of different angles, not only the sustainability angle, but also that whatever you do that is sustainable is also cost efficient and quick. And that's all good things, right? Nonetheless, this is the agenda. First, just like to ca cover what Date Robot does and sort of why we do it, and then go through a theoretical underpinning on what red and green AI is, and then how to shift from red to green, how to achieve this in Date Robot. But as I said, uh, you could implement it yourself. The, the math and the science applies regardless of where you're working, and then to also take it a, a bit wider. Uh, a number of challenges related to being productive with uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning today. These are a few examples that uh, illustrate what the situation is like. So there is a very high project failure rate. There's a lot of job openings for data scientists out there. And there's not much monitoring going on of uh, data and machine learning assets, uh, mostly models in production, that is. Uh, in Today, um, I meet, and I'm sure that you do as well, uh, analysts trying to solve machine learning problems. So maybe they started with some type of spreadsheet, tracking a KPI, and then it became more granular. So they were looking at uh, data at uh, its finest possible granularity, like transactions or customers, or that may be. Uh, so there will become more rows, and, but there also becomes more features or variables or columns. So the, com the complexity increases and the data requirements as well. And it becomes much more tricky to, to work in potentially your spreadsheets or, or in your visualization platforms to uh, take into account all of these uh, uh, variables that you know were important to, to monitor what you're trying to, uh, uh, to analyze and, and also to become more proactive and potentially be able to predict the future. That's one thing. Other thing is that there is an existing set of data scientists, but yeah, um, they are very popular. So they can be quite difficult to retain at times. Uh, but uh, if you manage to get a hold of a couple who are loyal and sort of uh, delivering, 
they have to prioritize and compromise a lot because there is a lot of demand for their skills and the workload is expanding and that creates a project backlog. Um, yeah, so that's obviously uh, an issue as well. And then uh, since very little is, is monitored in terms of models in production, uh, it, it makes it sort of risky and difficult um, but also to uh, to govern and adopt. Uh, IT ops is a very different thing from machine learning operations because in machine learning operations you need to include uh, data specific things that are perhaps not uh, a part of a traditional DevOps monitoring suite. And if people can trust that your models are making predictions and that also these models are making accurate and relevant predictions that make sense, why would they adopt and use them? And there may be also regulatory requirements on top of this. All of these challenges uh, is sort of inhibiting data science from, from uh, happening. And uh, what we try to do with that is uh, that we upskill analysts to become citizen data scientists by using uh, no code and uh, automated workflows and with guardrails in place so that they can't commit any of the classical mistakes. But also we let data scientists become force multipliers by being able to collaborate with the citizen data scientists and help them out and guide them where they might get stuck. And uh, if there may be some type of issue with the data that might be difficult to detect if you uh, are not well versed with how to evaluate machine learning models, for example. And then also, uh, when you, as a data scientist, adopt an automation first uh, mindset, uh, it, it can and it will increase your productivity so that you can leverage data robot uh, to automate uh, some of the stuff that you might find difficult yourself. Myself, I always struggle to work with, for example, image data. So if something can help me automate that part, I can focus on the things where I'm better and then potentially come to the end product quicker. Uh, also with built-in support for, as I said, tricky data types, such as visual data, images, geospatial data, time series, text, what have you. Uh, and you can deploy, monitor, and manage any models, regardless of where you built it, in data robot or somewhere else. And you can deploy and monitor and manage it anywhere. So it can come from anywhere and it can be published anywhere, but you can deploy, monitor, and manage it in data robot. And they're ready to surface predictions so that you can consume them whenever you want. So that's sort of, the quick take on that robot, what we do and why. Uh, stepping out of that, I'm talking about red and green AI now. Um, well, <laughs> what is the problem really? Uh, these are from a research paper uh, and uh, it compares the estimated carbon emissions from training common text models compared to familiar consumption. So as you can see there, uh, training a model can be like owning and using a car for a lifetime. Uh, and you know, it, it has probably happened on, on many occasions actually that a guy such as myself has been uh, playing around with uh, a big deep learning model in some type of data center on GPUs and without really realizing it, uh, I would have burnt quite a lot of money and carbon emissions just because I wanted to test a few things. So what does that mean? Well, uh, bad news. <laughs> we this this is not sustainable. And uh, one thing is that it uh, releases a lot of carbon emissions when training the models. Uh, but the other thing is also that these models are so big and so resource intensive that you need to have a data center or a national government or uh, a huge corporation like Apple or Netflix behind your back to be able to actually run this because no one person or smaller organization can afford this, right? So it's becoming a democratic concern as well. Um, that's however beyond the scope of this presentation, but that is important. And uh, the reason why this happens is that, you know, machine learning community wants to increase accuracy of their models. One common way of increasing accuracy in models is just to increase the model size. Instead of having a thousand parameters, you have 300 million parameters. And then uh, it becomes a couple of percentage points more accurate. And then you can 
publish your results and you get a couple of pats on the back and you say, you did great. But uh, yeah, as you can see here on the left hand side, um, to start 2013, you required um, fewer petaflops per day to, to train your models. And then it just increased because computational power became more commodity and it became available to, to more big companies. They started to build more and more complex models, such as the AlphaGo models. Maybe you saw the documentary. If you didn't, check it out. It's great. Um, but then if you plot this uh, accuracy as a function of computational effort, and so on the y-axis, we have the accuracy of the model, and on the x-axis, we have how many millions floating point operations, meaning calculations that has to be done to train the model. You can actually see that the ResNet model here on the side, um, I should have a laser pointer. This ResNet model right here is 80% accurate almost. Not much less than the SCNet model at the very right, which contains more than 40 times more floating point operations. So. With visualizing things like this, you can see that maybe this SCNet model isn't that much better. It's just that you made it a lot more complex and big, and that has given it a few percentage point increase, but really, who, who cares? Is that where the big value is in? The red AI is when you purchase better results by just adding more compute power to it. And it's not very impressive to do. Anybody can do it as long as you have the biggest data centers in the universe and a couple of PhDs to throw at it. But uh, the real value is when you can do something by, uh, by still not increase the resource you needed for it by a lot. We require new metrics for this. <laughs> These are actually from uh, a master's thesis I found at Linköping University in Sweden. I think it sums it up quite well. So uh, machine learning is a two-stage rocket, right? You first train models and then you make inference with them. So you make predictions. Uh, so you can consider uh, your carbon emissions or your research use in training, uh, but also when making predictions. So it's two different things. If you only build a model like once a year, maybe it doesn't really matter if you uh, waste a lot of resources on, on, on that, as long as it's efficient to make predictions later if you want to make a lot of predictions. But then you might have the opposite scope that you train a lot of models, but you don't make as many predictions because you're more interested in, in insights or uh, uh, any type of R&D environment. So here are a few uh, uh, suggested uh, metrics to capture what we call energy efficiency. And that's when you divide your useful work done with your used energy. So your useful work done here would be, you know, uh, captured by any type of accuracy metric of your model and used energy would, would be uh, uh, how much resources you need to spend on that. Uh, model size could be one thing to estimate um, the used energy to, to train a model, but also how long time it took uh, or how much energy was needed if you can actually get that information somewhere. And it's, it's good to know that um, when you um, train a model on a certain infrastructure, given the amount of other traffic that happens in that infrastructure at the same time. Let's say all your colleagues are also building models at that time or using your infrastructure for something else. But if there is a strain on the infrastructure, uh, it might mean that the training time is, is, is longer to do when other people are using infrastructure as well than it would have been when less people are using the infrastructure. So some of these, such as training time, for example, are not very stable across time because they may vary with how many other people are using your platform. Um, but uh, there are lots of different methods of discussing this and you can probably find one that is useful for you. In academia they talk a lot about flops, so floating point operations, because it's really platform infrastructure and time independent, so it's very comparable across everything. But if all of your business are on, for example, Amazon Web Services, then that doesn't really matter, right? Um, so yeah, you need to consider your reality when talking about these metrics. Um, sorry, I missed that whole point about this. Green AI is when you make AI efficient and accurate. So if you look at the scatter plot we looked at previously, uh, and uh, 
then you uh, divide uh, the accuracy with the billion floating point operations. Then we can see where we get the most bang for the buck. So you can see here that the FV net one, which is the one on the far left, uh, but with an accuracy of 75%, basically, uh, then that one is the winner in that competition. Whereas the SC net model, which is in accuracy terms the best, is, is actually the worst. Uh, so that is one way of, of, of analyzing this. Um, next steps here is to sort of how to maximize efficiency in machine learning in general, and also a bit about what it looks like in data robot, uh, and then uh, sort of how to pick the right projects, etc. <clears throat> so the cost function proposed by a couple of researchers uh, at the Allen Institute of AI uh, is that uh, the cost grows linearly with uh, the cost of processing a single example, so that's like a row of data basically, size of the training data set and the number of hyperparameter experiments. Uh, that's the equation of red AI as they coin it. So if you want to, to minimize these uh, in uh, the example one, the observation or the raw data needs to pass through all the parameters in a model. So if you use a small model with fewer necessary parameters, both in training and in scoring, that reduces E in this equation. So you should really avoid deep learning unless it's really warranted. And it's almost never warranted. So why worry about that? Um, but in some cases it is. D, yes, it's, that's the size of data. So you know more data normally increases accuracy, but the marginal contribution of adding more data decreases quite quickly. So don't use too much data, but also not too little. Try to sort of find some useful middle ground. Uh, filter out as much as possible before modeling in terms of both the rows and columns. Uh, and also downsample, so don't use all your data. This is especially true if you're working with time-dependent or classification problems. If you have 95% cases of uh, a uh, true and 5% cases of uh, false, and you're really interested in modeling when something will be false, you don't need to have these 95% true values in the data. You can reduce that dramatically while still maintaining accuracy of your models. If you have time dependent problems that, you know, for example, if there's been a pandemic recently and you know that the data from 2020 is not very useful, then you will probably end up with a more useful model that is only looking at more recent data. So if you have a time component in it, think about it and then get rid of the data that you don't need. To look further back in databases and data sources is normally not helping anybody. Uh, Use feature selection techniques, and if possible, do that prior to starting your modeling. Some of them are built in when training models, but then you know you have sort of already uh, started to, to to burn a bit of, of uh, carbon. And then also consider file types. Some of them are more space efficient than others. H hyperparameters. So hyperparameters they are tuned within models to maximize the predictive power of them. Can be uh, optimized in a couple of ways. You can do it manually, or you can do it by testing all possible combinations. That is something we'd advise against. It's not a very efficient way. It will waste a lot of time and resources. Uh, so do it to some extent, but use it through a smart search of the hyperparameter space, not all of it. Uh, and remember that you're probably just going to make a couple of percentage points uh, of, of accuracy by tuning hyperparameters. The real value is finding the right data for your model. So don't spend too much time on that. It's almost never that beneficial. Um, in date robot, how is this done? Notice the Winamp logo for all of you kids of the 90s out there. Um, so our exploratory data analysis before even starting modeling removes redundant features that are not useful. That decreases the amount of data and can do so quite drastically actually. So here we see that this variable here, millitol or feature, uh, they probably remove it because it has few values. 99.9% .9 of them are no, and then we just have a couple of rows of steady down and up. It's not useful for modeling, it's discarded. We find that out for you prior to modeling. We let you in a very visual way downsample your data so uh, that you can uh, uh, easily get that done. Uh, it would require some expert coding in the good old days, but not anymore. Uh, we build lists of features for you to use for modeling, and we also let you add your own so that you can use the, uh, the ones that are necessary. And we also recommend which ones will make the best result for you. 
Uh, we provide tons of information uh, that will let you combine accuracy with the uh, training energy and inference energy so that you can easily sort uh, your results by how efficient they are. And uh, we let you choose models based on how quick you are scoring to predictions. That's a sign of the efficiency. Uh, we provide learning curves so that you know how uh, uh, how much value it adds to, to bring more data to the table so that you can see that when these do not drop anymore, uh, you don't need any more data. I have tons of examples where we reduce data dramatically for customers that it's necessary to make accurate models. And to maximize the green in your project, there are a couple of different things that, that you can do. So this is sort of an overview of what you're doing in, in the machine learning process, right? The AI workflow. Mm -hmm. Uh, so during the discovery and problem definition, try to find use cases that lead to lower carbon emissions for you as an enterprise, like, I don't know, fuel optimization or any type of resource ways that you can identify to reduce that. But more than anything, make sure that the business is on board so you're not wasting resources on your project, both in terms of manpower and compute power, because if, if the business is not on board, then nothing is ever going to materialize anyway, and it's just you guys having a bunch of great ideas, right? and make sure that CO2 is part of the success KPIs. During data preparation exploration, try to find the optimal amount of data. I know it sounds a bit hard, but uh, there are some methods you can apply to this. Uh, when building and developing tuning, avoid deep learning, perform a smart search of which models to pursue, so not only hyperparameters, but also which models use a diverse set and then narrow in on the ones that show to be promising. Automate feature engineering and selection so that you reduce the data as quickly as possible. Uh, standardize insights and documentation for quick adoption and understanding and knowing whether to proceed with the project or not. But again, avoid deep learning. <laughs> it makes everything just much more messy. Uh, and then when opera operationalizing and monitoring your model, Back in the good old days, it could be tempting for a data scientist to retrain a model as soon as new data comes in. So you could perhaps potentially just set up a pipeline that would automate most of that, but you would just have to spend some time to validate it and then promote it to a deployment. Uh, but that can be a great waste of resources, um, or well, it is, because if you can instead monitor your models so that you know when they have degraded to the extent that you really need to retrain and replace, then you can reduce the time you waste on keeping old models alive and focus on new use cases. Uh, but you will also put a lot less strain on your infrastructure so that uh, you will burn less in the model training process. And also make sure that models integrate with existing infrastructure so that it's actually working in production. Remove, uh, remove any needs for duct tape to, to get it out there. Uh, we like to set up these. Um, uh, this is actually a use case we implemented on our cloud. So we predict how much resources is necessary for all of our compute jobs. Uh, and then uh, we can uh, tailor the containers we use to, to train these models and other compute jobs uh, so that we are not overestimating our needs. And then we, of course, reduce our costs, but we also reduce uh, the strain on infrastructure, of course. Uh, and uh, what you need to do from this is that you need to add some something green to them, a green component. So what that can look like is like this, that you, for one of these one-pagers, you, you add a sustainability calculation to it. Like, how will we assess what impact this will have on sustainability or what sort of theory that we can help with this? Um, but then also uh, not looking at only one use case, but at your entire backlog, a very common way to sort your backlog is by the potential in them, but also how possible they will be to do the feasibility. But if you just add a column that discusses their impact on sustainability, that can help you in sorting them and scoring them and finding out which ones to pursue. You shouldn't underestimate the value this can have for your brand as well. So in summary, don't stare blindly at accuracy. Minimize experiments, data and hyperparameter tuning in every step of the process. Have a platform that helps with it. Don't retrain models unless you have to pick the right projects and please connect with me and we can discuss this further or talk about the uh, multiplication of data science in the enterprise. Thank you, everybody. Thanks a lot, Oscar. Thank you so much. So I would like to ask my hero, 
uh, challenger who is all the time asking question if he is here. Eugene, are you here? I just gave you co-host option. Or the colleagues from Posti, Posti from Finland. They, they are a lot of them here and I would like to see some questions from people who haven't asked anything yet. So Eugene, are you here? From Speira, Eugene. Yes, Eugene. Yeah, I'm here, but uh, uh, no questions so far. I need some challenging questions, huh? Okay, so, so far so good, no problem. Uh, let's see if other questions from colleagues from Posti. I see some colleagues from Finland from Posti, but I don't see them engaged in questioning. Ricardo, if you are there from Shell, no question. There are a lot of potential use cases for, for these uh, companies that you're talking about. For example, how to reduce the risk when uh, drilling for oil and, and then reduce the amount of spill. But also when you drive around with, with mail, you may want to do it in the most energy efficient way, right? Exactly. So I'm just trying to to get the, the most out of it to, to challenge, but uh, it seems they don't have questions. That's fine. Oh, I'm using, yes. Uh, uh, Ricardo speaking. I don't That's have questions. I'm just impressed. I really like this concept of the red uh, versus green and uh, yeah, time to digest now, but it's uh, yeah, excellent point. Not to overcomplicate the model, but to look to the result and then to shape the best, uh, le less consuming model to get to the same result, let's say, or uh, yeah, optimize the combination. Very, Thanks. very well done, Oscar. It's really make us think, I, I guess, not only me, but all of us in the audience. I'm flattered. Interesting. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ricardo, for getting engaged. Just Gustav, again, a question. How do you address uh, versioning when going for no code? Gustav, you have the camera and mic possibility on. If I didn't correct, uh, correctly read the question, you can ask yourself. Uh, that, is that is great. I, I, I admit that I have some bias for, for code being a developer. <laughs> Same here. Uh, so what was the question? How, how to handle version control if you're not using code? Yeah, I think you said that uh, you have a no code approach. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, the data robot platform can be accessed either through a very shiny and good looking graphical user interface. Uh, but it's also accessible through a REST API or through Python and R. So you can use it in a code method as well. So then you would get version control because you can you know, put stuff in, in, uh, in, in different uh, developer software that is tailored for that. But uh, if you use it, uh, no code. Uh, version management is possible to do at the project level, but also at the model level, uh, and also for any type of data asset that you, that you might have. Um, I understand. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, sorry about the noise. Remember that we are in my home, even though we are in a conference. Using your own mute if you're talking. Sorry, sorry, I didn't notice that. So Dennis, Dennis Jacobson uh, from Myers, if you can switch on your camera, you have co-host option now for this question. We oh, no problem. The time is over just fastly to read the question, but please reach yeah. out to Oscar on LinkedIn as well for clarification when adding green to the prioritization. Are you looking at the resource need or also the potential outcome CO2E saving potential, what is? Uh, so yeah, 
I, I, I would focus on the potential outcome for um, carbon emission savings because that is normally the big one, right? If, if you have a project that requires a lot of data and models uh, and training and predictions and you know will be resource intensive on your infrastructure, but it is about reducing, uh, for example, fuel consumption when flying airplanes all over the world or not, I think that the return on investment will be so much positive if you just get that use case in production. So it's more about that. Yeah, thanks, Dennis. Yes. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to give you five more minutes time because we will extend uh, five minutes for the last two presentations. So we will not have problem with time this five minutes. Uh, Igor, go ahead with your yeah. question from Libher. Yeah, I had one question. What makes you different, for example, in compared to H2O product? Because you're doing in the same direction, I had a feeling. I, I have a couple of friends who work at H2O. Uh, very but but it's not the biggest difference, okay. <laughs> uh, but but uh, they they have a, a bit of an, another take on things. Uh, working with uh, uh, they may perhaps cater better to certain audiences, but I don't really know this myself because it's not like they let me try, <laughs> right? Uh, but uh, we have uh, similar similarities, obviously, uh, um, and uh, yeah. I, I would like you to assess that and then uh, maybe present next year what the difference is. I think that that would be a valuable exercise. <laughs> Thanks again. Just one question from Sami uh, from Neste. Uh, gut feeling, how much do you see over modeling for new percentage points? Uh, Sami, correct me if I, if I get the question wrong, but... Um, uh, I, I see a lot of uh, um, people, including myself at times, uh, just adding new models with slightly different configurations uh, to, to my project uh, instead of you know, taking a step back and thinking what would be a relevant new data source to connect to this or how should this feature be engineered. So uh, I would guess that everybody over models a little bit uh, but it's you know great to have a clearly defined success criteria from the start that if we can achieve this type of outcome in terms of how useful the model would be, then I move on to the next project and then we can iterate on the other one in the future. But to to not you know uh, become obsessive compulsive basically and just try to polish that model until it gains a few bumps. But it's very hard to to stay away from. I would say. Yeah, that that was exactly the question. Thank you, thank you for the for the answer. Kind of additional one as well. That okay, how uh, like John said earlier that kind of getting the goal right. So not even necessarily adding the data, but also making sure that you're answering the correct question right. It's kind of one of those things that you don't answer the wrong question and improve a model that doesn't need to be used. <laughs> Yeah, and I guess we all have done that at least twice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, Sami, one last question from uh, H&M Group. I suppose Patrick is writing. Uh, so the question, Patrick, uh, you see it as well, uh, Oscar on the chat, yeah? Patrick Waldenstorm yeah. just jumped in again, so missed this presentation, unfortunately, but very important topic, energy uses from data processing will explode. And I think the only part I saw, adding the sustainability. So. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, Patrick, we can uh, sync uh, offline and, and I can give you the presentation um, more properly and we can discuss further. Uh, I know that this is a big topic for H&M. You want to be a leader in this space, clearly, both in terms of how you do machine learning, but also with your business. So, yeah. yeah. Oh. Hit me up later. Okay, so we will be sharing the presentations one week after the event later. So next Saturday, Sunday, it will be done and sent to everybody. Thanks 